Okay, welcome everyone. Good evening. Uh, the uh, discussion tonight should be really fascinating given recent history. Uh, I'm in New York City. I'm a former member of the of TWU Local 100 Subway and Bus Workers. I just wanted to make note that yesterday morning, uh, Democratic Mayor Bill de Blasio attacked Occupy City Hall, which was an encampment to demand defunding of the police. And like Bloomberg's attack on Occupy in 2011, with the cooperation of Barack Obama in the national plan, uh, the protesters were swept out of the park and as well as the homeless. And now both de Blasio and Mayor, uh, rather Governor uh, Andrew Cuomo is trying to flex their muscle uh, and uh, talk up uh, uh, backing up the uh, New York City police with maybe troops. Uh, we'll see how that plays out. We're here tonight to discuss the incredible Teamsters strike of 1934. And we know unions are taking tremendous blows these days. And to hear the story of the Teamsters, Locals 574, is truly inspiring. And David Reilly, who has studied uh, the history of labor in Minneapolis and elsewhere, is uh, the perfect person to relate that incredible story. So David, uh, I will leave it to you to uh, guide us through that history. Okay, <clears throat> thank you, Marty. And uh, greetings to all friends and comrades. I. <clears throat> I hope you can see what I got up on the screen. Uh, the cover of uh, Teamster Rebellion, uh, account of the strike written by Farrell Dobbs, one of the younger leaders of the strike in 1934. And it, uh, it took him four volumes to get through the whole story of the, uh, the Teamsters in Minneapolis. Uh, so uh, I'm not gonna be able to uh, give you an exhaustive account of everything, but I'm gonna focus on the uh, events in uh, the sum spring and summer of 1934. The, uh, there were actually three strikes in Minneapolis by truck drivers and helpers in 1934. Uh, the first one was uh, carried out by coal truck drivers and helpers and uh, yard workers in uh, the February of 34, when it was uh, bitterly cold. And uh, at that time, virtually everything ran on coal, <clears throat> railroads and uh, apartment buildings and factories. And so losing coal was uh, shut everything down and the employers, capitulated uh, rapidly and the strike was settled uh, in three days. After that, they, after that uh, they got a kind of a handshake deal from the employers, uh, but not a, not a written contract. And uh, after everybody was back to work, the employers started uh, harassing and discriminating and picking out the leaders of the uh, strike and firing them and uh, reneging on the agreement. So at that point, the, it was clear that they, uh, they had to organize for, a, for another strike, which this time was going to be a general strike of all the, all the drivers and helpers in Minneapolis. And uh, this was, uh, of course, this was occurring in the middle of the depression when there was 25% uh, unemployment in the country uh, starting in 1929. As you probably know, uh, 
uh, President Roosevelt uh, took a kind of conciliatory attitude towards labor organizing at that time because I, he was justifiably afraid of well, what would happen <clears throat> if, uh, if the workers uh, weren't able to uh, go out and strike for, their, strike for their demands and the improvement of their jobs and their living conditions and wages. So that, uh, that gave a little, uh, a little boost to the uh, morale of the workers around the country and strikes started uh, happening in really rapid succession. Uh, you probably know that there were three great strikes in 1934 that have made the history books in Minneapolis strike led by the, uh, the Trotskyists uh, who were a part of a, a group that had been expelled from the Communist Party in 1928. And uh, the strike in uh, Toledo by the uh, Autolite workers who were working for corporations that made all kinds of uh, auxiliary equipment for the auto industry, uh, led by a group of uh, young radicals uh, who were organizing an unemployed movement in uh, Lucas County, which is where Toledo is located. And then there was a then there was a great strike in San Francisco by the uh, longshore workers, led by the uh, Communist Party in large part, and uh, they all uh, they all confronted uh, massive uh, attempts at repression. The, uh, the National Guard ultimately was called out in uh, all of those strikes, and. Uh, there were actually many more strikes in 1934 than that. I discovered this by looking for photos uh, with the keyword 1934 in, uh, on uh, eBay, where they have, uh, they're putting up for sale all these uh, photos from the newspaper archives uh, of the different papers that have started to sell them off. So, but in 1934 and all of a sudden, all kinds of other strikes started popping up too. You know, it was the, uh, I think the, the best known one after the, the, those three I just mentioned was the textile strike in uh, North Carolina. And uh, that was also a, a, a massive strike. Unfortunately, it was defeated. Uh, it was led by uh, some uh, pretty miserable leadership uh, from the American Federation of Labor. And uh, they were also uh, confronted with National Guard and police and uh, unable to sustain the strike. There were a whole number of others that were in industrial towns in the Midwest and in, uh, in New England. Uh, so this was a huge, taken as a, a national phenomena, this was a huge upsurge. Uh, and uh, the, uh, after pretty much nothing happening in the labor movement since the end of World War I, all of a sudden the, the workers were in the streets and on the picket lines and uh, definitely uh, indicated to uh, the national government that they had to make some concessions. But first they wanted to see if they could take it down with <clears throat> with clubs and bullets uh, and they weren't able to. So uh, Minneapolis uh, workers uh, and the leaders uh, called a uh, mass organizing meeting in April of 1934. And at that time they had uh, the governor the state of Minnesota belonged to the Farmer Labor Party, which was an independent party based on organized labor and the, uh, the organized farmers, uh, the working farmers. And uh, Governor Floyd Olson sent a enthusiastic letter of endorsement to the meeting, uh, the organizing meeting, and they had about 5,000 people there and uh, in a big theater in downtown Minneapolis, and they signed them up uh, left and right. 
and uh, they formulated demands to bring to the uh, employers, which the employers <clears throat> rejected out of hand. And uh, so another strike was called uh, in uh, May of 1934. Uh, May 19th was the first day of the strike. The uh, union re rented a, a headquarters uh, to uh, make sure that they were able to organize uh, in the most efficient manner. They had uh, uh, a lot of amenities there for the strikers. Uh, they had a cafeteria or uh, they could feed strikers who were there uh, at the headquarters and were going out uh, on mobile pickets. And uh, they had a infirmary there to treat uh, workers who were injured in the course of battles of the police. And they had a big area for a meeting hall. And at that point, they had they'd gone from a uh, a little two by four local of uh, maybe 150 members and local 574 when this all started in, at the uh, beginning of 1934 and went out uh, to the time the, stri of the May strike, they had uh, five to 6,000 workers already signed up and uh, mobilized. And uh, the uh, this is. Uh, if you can see this, this is a picture of uh, the uh, strike headquarters uh, that uh, was uh, painted by Jerry uh, <clears throat> Jerry Hudson de Leon, who was the sister of uh, uh, Carlos Hudson, who was a uh, active participant in the strike and uh, became the uh, de facto editor of the. Uh, the daily newspaper that the union produced is called the uh, the organizer, of course, and uh, was uh, generally believed to be the first uh, daily strike publication put out by a union in the United States. Uh, I think there was one exception to that, but uh, we could get into that later. But this is this is a gorgeous painting, uh, as you can see there. Uh, this is uh, the ground floor of the strike headquarters, and there you can see upstairs is uh, the uh, area where they have meetings and where the uh, uh, the strike hospital was located. And uh, this this one was right in downtown Minneapolis, uh, uh, directly across from the uh, Minneapolis Club, which was the the place where the uh, the bosses went uh, to. Uh, congregate and plot and uh, hang out with each other. Uh, it's still there, the corner of 8th and 2nd uh, Street in uh, Minneapolis. It still has the same function as it did then. Uh, they, didn't have, they didn't let women in the front door until the early 70s. So it was a male bastion for sure. Uh, Commemorated this, these strikes for a long time uh, here. Uh, I think we started in uh, the first commemoration was in uh, 1980, and there was a, a film, a documentary made uh, of that uh, event, and it's called Labor's Turning Point, and uh, it's available on YouTube, so anybody can look at it. Uh, it's about 40 minutes long, and it uh, both includes uh, interviews with some of the strikers and uh, the event that uh, commemorated the strike uh, where the, uh, they had uh, at least 100 surviving veterans of the strike present. And uh, also uh, includes a lot of newsreel footage that was taken during the strike, uh, very dramatic uh, stuff. Uh, the uh, uh, the strike veterans were in their uh, late sixties or at best, I would say. Uh, that was really the last time it was possible to uh, 
to uh, interview them and interact with them. And the, uh, the producers of the film did a great job. Uh, you'll see a lot of the uh, a lot of the leading participants in the in the strike there. So we, we've continued uh, every five years to uh, have some kind of commemoration uh, of the strikes to. Uh, Honor the uh, achievements of the strike and to keep the keep the, uh, the memory of it alive and in front of the general public. Uh, in uh, 2004, we started with uh, street festival uh, connected with the. Uh, the commemoration down in the area uh, where, where the, the worst confrontations in the strike happened in uh, in July, and uh, so so we combined it with uh, speeches and uh, uh, all kinds of uh, musical performers who came down and volunteered. <clears throat> to uh, perform it in the middle of the, the area known as the warehouse district. And uh, so this is a poster uh, from 19, uh, uh, 2019 uh, that was distributed uh, to uh, publicize the, the commemoration and uh, Uh, we're anticipating that uh, we'll do another one in uh, 2024. Um, I'm going to go through some of the uh, some photos here of uh, our uh, our strike heroes, uh, so you can. Get a look at them. Uh, this this photo is, is as you can see from the uh, the caption is uh, has Jake Cooper on the left, then Oscar Cooper next, Harry DeBoer and Max Geldman. Uh, Oscar Cooper was actually a member of Electricians Local 292. So on the executive board there. He was a member of the Petrasius group in Minneapolis. And he played a big part in uh, mobilizing the, uh, the construction trades to come out and uh, strike uh, in sympathy with the strike with the truck drivers. Uh, and uh, Jake, Jake Cooper was a young man at that time. Uh, I think he was only 16 or 17 in 1934. And uh, he, uh, these were all members of the Trotskyist group in Minneapolis. And Jake uh, went on to be a, a terrific uh, supporter and uh, organizer and support of the, uh, the Hormel workers in Austin, Minnesota in 1985-86 uh, when they went on strike. Uh, third one from the left is Harry DeBoer. Uh, he's, uh, he came originally from uh, Northwest Minnesota. His, his parents were immigrants from Holland and sympathizers of the IWW. Uh, they were farmers, and, but they, uh, when an IWW organizer came through that area, they put them up and uh, so, Harry got a early uh, introduction to what uh, labor radicalism was uh, just as a child. Max Gelman uh, was originally from uh, New York, I believe. Came out here and uh, uh, became a, a part of the uh, Minneapolis Trotskyist group. Play, played a big role in organizing the unemployed uh, during the strike. These are the two primary leaders of the strike. Uh, on the left, Carl Skoglund, who was born in Sweden and came to the United States in 1911. 
was an active member of the Socialist Party, you know, the Swedish Scandinavian Socialist Federation, which was a component of the Socialist Party. Yeah, this is all before World War One and the Russian Revolution. Uh, and uh, he, he was, uh, at that time, before World War One, he was a railroad worker uh, employed uh, as a car man, as they called it, uh, maintaining that the Pullman cars that, that ran on the uh, on the railroad lines uh, out of Minneapolis. And uh, V.R. Dunn, Ray Dunn is uh, on the right. He was the other central leader and uh, brains <coughs> of the strike. And uh, he, uh, he was, a, was an active participant in the uh, Trotskyist movement until he died in 1970. Carl Skoglin uh, was a few years older and he lived until 1960. He died out at the, uh, the SWP had a, they called the Trotsky School out in, uh, in New Jersey in the, up, in the, up in the hills somewhere. Uh, and uh, he was out there working on, as a maintenance person at the place. And uh, he died there in, uh, in uh, 1960. The two of them uh, had met uh, around the uh, era of the formation of the Communist Party of America, which they both became leading members of in uh, 1919. And uh, Eventually, were expelled in 1928, along with James Cannon and, uh, and others in the central leadership of the CP for supporting uh, Trotsky and the uh, disputes uh, that were uh, uh, that the uh, Communist International was focused on. There's some more of the uh, comrades uh, from the strike, uh, left to right, um, Grant Dunn, who was on the, in the passenger side of the car there, uh, one of the three Dunn brothers that uh, were that probably publicly known more than any, any others as strike leaders. Uh, Harry DeVore again, and then uh, Walter Hagstrom and Ray Rainbolt in the, in the rear. This is Jim Cannon and Max Shackman busted in Minneapolis. They had come to uh, help with the strike. Cannon was the central leader, I think most of you know, of the, uh, uh, the American Trotskyist group, and a talented journalist, revolutionary journalist, and uh, tactician, and uh, so the, the party had brought him out here to assist with uh, planning uh, strike activity and uh, writing uh, for the, the organizer, the paper of the local 574. And you can, you can see uh, right in front of him on a table, there's a copy of the militant newspaper, which was the par party's newspaper at that time. Max Shackman also was one of the founding Trotskyists. Uh, who was expelled along with Cannon in 1928. Very talented individual. He also came out here and uh, they were staying at a hotel in uh, Minneapolis and the police learned about their presence and went in and arrested them for no particular reason other than being radicals. And uh, they were essentially exiled to St. Paul for the duration of the strike. Um, but um, that's just right across the river, so not a big, uh, not a big separation. So the Cannon and Shackman continued to be out here for a major portion of the strike and uh, uh, doing their part to help mobilize the workers and organize uh, against the, uh, the police violence and the employers. Here's a, this is a classic picture of the three Dunn brothers at strike headquarters, uh, left to right, 
Ray Dunn with a telephone and uh, Grant Dunn looking at the uh, organizer newspaper says the strike is on and uh, Miles Dunn or Mickey Dunn, the, the third Dunn brother, uh, they're uh, active, uh, quite active in writing for the, for the uh, organizer uh, throughout the duration of the strike. Uh, and uh, he uh, eventually was elected president of the local 574. These guys here had just been released from the, uh, the stockade in St. Paul uh, at the state fairgrounds where they'd, they'd been uh, confined along with uh, 100 or so other strikers uh, after the National Guard was called out and uh, raided the strike headquarters in Minneapolis. So you have here, left to right, uh, um, Grant Dunn and then Bill Brown there with the cool Gatsby hat. He was the uh, president of Local 574 and uh, not a member of the uh, party, but a, uh, a labor militant who saw the uh, opportunities that were before them in organizing at that time and through his influence into uh, help, helping uh, to uh, win the, uh, the union membership over to uh, the support of the strike at the beginning there. The person next to him is Mickey Dunn uh, and uh, next to him is Ray Dunn again. And then the person on the far right is Albert Goldman who was a also a, a Trotskyist who uh, uh, was an attorney and came out to help uh, with some of the legal work uh, involved in the strike, like uh, representing workers who got, got arrested for picketing and so on. And it's Farrell Dobbs here, author of Teamster Rebellion and a uh, uh, guy in his uh, late twenties who uh, was work, happened to be working in the coal yards uh, at that time uh, that they were organizing and, and met the uh, met the comrades there and uh, threw himself into the strike and became a, a central leader of uh, of it and of the uh, what came after that <clears throat> in the remainder of the 30s when the uh, Teamsters in Minneapolis set out to organize or the road drivers into the Teamsters Union and uh, Farrell was the key uh, person in that effort. Uh, he uh, resigned from the union in uh, 1940 to go to New York and uh, become a, a leader of the Socialist Workers Party. Uh, and uh, until his uh, death in the early 1980s, he was the central leader of, after Jim Cannon of the, of the SWP. This is Jack Maloney. He's, uh, he was one of the uh, youngest strike leaders. He was in his early 20s. He got, uh, he got badly uh, beaten up by the police uh, in the early days of the strike. And uh, later on, uh, uh, it was uh, one of the uh, 60 some workers who were shot down by the Minneapolis police on Bloody Friday, July 20th. He uh, was railroaded to uh, federal prison by the FBI in 1940 uh, for allegedly hijacking a scab truck in Iowa and taking it to. South Dakota, which then uh, uh, was construed as a federal crime because he'd gone across state lines. Uh, and uh, so he was sent to Leavenworth prison for two years. Uh, and uh, when he got out in 1942, the war was on and uh, the leading comrades and uh, in the leadership of the union that had been sent to prison uh, by the federal government in 1941. So he 
you missed that uh, as a, this time in prison. When he was released, he went out to Seattle and uh, became a, a labor activist there, first as, as a seaman and then uh, in uh, 1950 or so when he was uh, and other militants were railroaded off the uh, ships by the Coast Guard. Uh, became a, an active longshoreman and he was elected president of the local union there uh, four or five times, I believe, and uh, remained uh, till the end of his life uh, a, a labor activist and a convinced revolutionary. This, uh, this guy is was known as Happy Holstein. He was a, a Ojibwe or Anishinaabe uh, man from uh, the White Earth Reservation in northern Minnesota, and uh, kind of a wild person. Uh, and uh, here he's wearing uh, the uh, traditional uh, garb of the uh, of the tribe. Uh, he lived a long time. He was, he's in the documentary. You can see him there. Uh, he was, he's interviewed also in the documentary. He was, uh, quite a fighter. And uh, uh, one of the few uh, Native Americans who were participants in the strike. There were a few, but, uh, and he was one of them. Uh, this is the uh, this is the opening of the strike in May May nineteenth, uh, nineteen thirty four, uh, at the Behrman Fruit Company in Minneapolis. If you're familiar with Minneapolis, it's, it was on Fifth Street, uh, just uh, west of First Avenue North, where there on one side of the street has this, this huge uh, industrial building. On it, and the other side they had the, the um, you can see on the truck the C. Thomas stores. This is one of the early, earliest uh, supermarket uh, businesses that uh, existed in uh, in Minneapolis, and that, that's where the first picket line was thrown up, and the cops came in and slugged everybody uh, with clubs, Jack. Uh, Jack was knocked unconscious there, and uh, the uh, after after that <coughs> happened, the uh, strikers uh, decided that uh, the uh, they were entitled to defend themselves, and they uh, armed themselves with clubs and uh, banisters from homes and anything any kind of piece of wood that uh, could be used in self defense, and. Uh, so when the, this was on a Saturday at the Beerman Fruit Company. So by Monday, they were ready for the cops. Uh, this is a map of uh, that uh, we created uh, for a history tour, visiting the, the sites that were significant in the strike. Uh, I won't try to uh, identify them all here for you, but uh, uh, we did a bus tour starting at the Labor Temple uh, up in the right hand corner and went basically through downtown Minneapolis uh, uh, and uh, and back to where the strike headquarters was located and uh, eventually out to uh, where the uh, shooting took place on Bloody Friday. This is uh, also from the May strike. This is uh, this is happening either on uh, May 21st or May 22nd when uh, the masses of the uh, strikers showed up in the warehouse district in downtown Minneapolis to take on the police. And you can you can see what a vast uh, assembly there is there. Uh, this just kind of accidentally shows up in here because this is what the site of the Battle of Deputies Run uh, on May 22nd looks like today. You know, everything's gone, but uh, along with the warehouses and so on. But uh, when we were doing a, a tour 
uh, of the strike. Uh, we we went by went by there in the bus just so people could get a picture uh, spatially of where it was during the strike. Okay, now we're moving into uh, Bloody Friday, <clears throat> July twentieth, uh, when uh, the uh, police set up a trap in uh, the warehouse district uh, in Minneapolis. At, uh, for the, any of you that are familiar with the warehouse district, uh, it's on the intersection of Sixth Street and Third Avenue North. The uh, the cops had uh, brought uh, one truck in and uh, pulled it up uh, to a loading dock uh, at uh, one of the uh, warehouses <coughs> at that intersection. It was obviously uh, obviously a setup. They had they'd taken the glass out of the truck and put chicken wire in and to protect it from anything that might be thrown at it. And they, eventually somebody came out of the, the warehouse with one box, put it in the truck, and the truck started moving uh, through the intersection. Uh, at that point, the police opened fire with shotguns and uh, 38 uh, caliber revolvers. Well, these are the cops down here. You can see they didn't dress <clears throat> as elaborately as they do today with all of the uh, spaceman gear on. But they they were armed and they were willing to shoot and they opened fire. Uh, you can see, if you look in the, ahead of them there, there's a guy just walking down the street. He doesn't seem to be particularly alarmed, but he's about to get shot in the back. This is the... Uh, intersection of uh, third and third and sixth street uh, the, uh, the truck on the left is the the decoy truck that the cops set up with its one uh, one box in it and it's pulling uh, across the intersection on the other side of it you see this dump truck that was uh, filled with pickets who set out to intercept it and uh, and behind these uh, Autos behind it are, are cop cars <clears throat> that were following the uh, following the truck, uh, and it's at that point that the uh, that the shooting begins. Here you see that truck again. The, uh, the other one, the decoy truck, is gone. This is the uh, picket truck. Uh, you know, they've already fired at it once. Uh, anybody left in the box of the truck is laying down to avoid being shot. And the cops are moving, <clears throat> moving forward uh, with their, with their shotguns and um, trying to intercept the truck and trying to do maximum damage to the strikers with gunfire. Here's a just a few seconds later, uh, uh, after that previous photo, you can see uh, that. Uh, Lower arrows pointing to the decoy truck, and the upper red arrows pointing to the uh, the pickup truck. Uh, they're just uh, about half a block down the street from the intersection here, and uh, you see from all the cars parked uh, there, they're, they're mostly cop cars there along the sidewalk and then in the foreground. And <clears throat> here, just a little bit later. Uh, the truck is barreling away. There's one guy hanging on the side of it there. And you can see they're about to intersect a, an automobile that's coming across 7th uh, Avenue. Unfortunately, got out of the way in time. And they, uh, they got that truck out of there as quickly as they could. This is one of the uh, two men who, was, who died from his wounds. Uh, being shot on Bloody Friday, his name Johnny Baylor, and uh, he's uh, he uh, he was grievously wounded, and his uh, turtle organs were basically destroyed. And he he uh, 
suffered for 11 days before he eventually died of his wounds. And uh, this, uh, this is uh, one of the cartoons from the organizer. Let's see, I think I'll go back to that. A very talented cartoonist who drew for the organizer. Not quite sure who that was, but I have a, I have a, a hunch that it was uh, Jerry DeLeon, Carlos Hudson's uh, sister, who was a very talented artist, as you saw. And uh, this is a kind of your classic uh, labor cartooning art style. So they have uh, the newsboy out there distributing the organizer and the fat cat uh, capitalist from the Citizens Alliance, which was the boss's organization, tumbling over. Uh, the organizer was crucial in, uh, in winning the strike. They printed it every day, except Sunday, and uh, was distributed uh, to uh, bars and union halls and other locations where workers were would gather. And they uh, took donations to support the printing and distribution of the uh, of the organizer and uh, told it what usually happens in a strike is that uh, that the uh, the capitalist media the boss press gets to say every day to the uh, people who were in the city that what their their version of the truth is which is never the truth and the and the unions forced to remain mute, but the, uh, this was a, a real innovation and a real, real bold uh, uh, step for the, uh, the union to take to uh, put out a, what was usually a, a four page tabloid newspaper every day, starting out from July 16th when the, uh, the third strike started. It ended uh, August 21st. Uh, organizer continued on after that for several months. Uh, the, uh, I think that there actually was uh, another striking that put out a daily paper uh, besides uh, this one here. And it was in uh, Butte, Montana and the, uh, where the copper miners went on strike in uh, 1918. And uh, the uh, moving party in producing that was uh, the oldest of the Dunn brothers, actually, Bill Dunn, who was uh, a, uh, uh, an electrical worker and was employed in, it. in the copper mines, along with uh, thousands of other people, mostly of Irish descent. And uh, they had, uh, so they, they published their paper uh, daily also. And uh, I think they was kind of forgotten about at the time when this declaration was made that the organizer was, was the only one, first one that had been published, but they were both um, magnificent publications. Uh, a lot of uh, humor in them, a lot of hard hitting articles and editorials and uh, Voices of the Strikers uh, was critical in uh, keeping the, the workers and the uh, general public that supported the, the strike uh, informed and, uh, during, during the strike and countering the, the lies of the bosses. And this is uh, actually from 1935. Uh, these men have gathered uh, to commemorate uh, the death of Henry Ness, who was the other uh, the other striker who was killed uh, on July 20th, it says 21st there, but that's when he died, shot on uh, July 20th. Uh, this is right, right at the corner where you will know, we'll show you later where we put the uh, commemorative plaque up uh, in 1915, 2015, sorry. Uh, 
from the strike. And you can see in the background, oh, I don't know if you can see the see my cursor, but uh, right up, this is uh, Sherman Williams Paint Company. And they had the famous uh, SWP uh, covers the earth icon with the, the globe and then the uh, tipped up uh, paint can pouring paint over the world. That building is still there. And uh, that was where Henry Ness uh, was shot about a block away from where the uh, original shooting started at uh, third and second. This is third and seventh street. And uh, this, uh, this guy on the far right is Happy Holstein again, who we, who we met earlier. Uh, there's the plaque that was placed in uh, on the uh, Sherwin Williams Paint Building, which is no longer a, has, has anything to do with the paint company. Uh, but it's uh, we got the permission of the owner, his name is Cliff. Uh, he was also a, a, I guess a history buff. He uh, he owned the building and rented rented it out for office space, and he had big blowups uh, oh, of photos taken from the strike up there. So we knew he was uh, interested, and uh, so we got uh, official permission from him uh, to put this up. Uh, these two women are granddaughters of Henry Ness, and they're holding. Uh, Two posters you can see. The one on the right is Johnny Baylor, and the one on the left is Henry Ness. And by 2015, we had uh, managed to make contact with uh, a lot of uh, the descendants, the strikers, uh, and including the, the family of Henry Ness, and they played a big part in the commemoration that occurred at that time. Here we have Millie Johnson, uh, age 100. Uh, she was the widow of Chester Johnson, who was a member of the so Socialist Workers Party and also a member of IBW, Electrical Workers Local 292, along with Oscar Coeur. And uh, he unfortunately died uh, in his uh, mid 50s, long before. Um, uh, before Millie, uh, Millie eventually passed away uh, last year, I think, at age 105. But she was, she's there celebrating the victory of the strike. This is just a couple of obituaries on Oscar Coover, uh, one from the uh, New York Times. We'll see, and one from the Minneapolis Labor Review. He died in 1950. He was a central leader of the uh, party uh, from the time he was recruited in, by Carl Skoglin during World War One, and uh, was one of the uh, 18 leaders of the uh, party who were sentenced to federal prison after a frame-up trial in 1941. Uh, which is uh, now, uh, I think, gathering more attention than it, it had before because of the uh, the, the nature of the, uh, the witch hunt legislation that was used to uh, convict them of uh, seeking, uh, seeking to overthrow the United States government by circulating Marxist literature. Oh, well, that's another story, but uh, there's been a book produced about it uh, by a labor historian uh, in New York uh, named, uh, name just slips me at the moment. Uh, but uh, so he, his, his passing was noted as being, a, as a, in his life as being a significant one. He was on the, I think I said he was on the executive board of the uh, IBW local for many, many years. Here's the, here's the plaque uh, 
that we placed there. Uh, you can see probably most of the details. We've got the th these three iconic photos here. That uh, the one on the right is the uh, uh, the commissary at the strike headquarters where workers were fed. Uh, strikers, pickets. Uh, center one is Bloody Friday, you saw earlier. And the one on the left is the uh, Battle of Deputies Run, that was called in downtown Minneapolis, where they fought the cops hand to hand. This uh, is the, uh, these are members of the, the Teamsters Union in Minneapolis who joined the commemoration in 2015. And uh, you can see a big mass of people. They had an earlier picnic a few blocks away. And then they, uh, they all marched down to the uh, site of the commemoration. Uh, you can see there's hundreds and hundreds of people there. They all have on uh, these uh, special t-shirts that were made to uh, commemorate the uh, commemorate the strike. And uh, the first time we really got uh, massive participation from the, uh, from the Teamsters Union. And uh, certainly it was a, a really important step in continuing to uh, commemorate the strike, remember it, and especially in these days uh, to see it as a possible wave of the future. Uh, so I'm going to stop here. There's a lot more that could be said, but uh, I'll give everybody a, a chance to weigh, weigh in on this with questions and comments. So I think Marty will, if you, Marty will explain how you can uh, be recognized to uh, comment or. Thank you, Dave. That was wonderful. I'm inspired by that picture of the march. Uh, you have displayed there of the Teamsters marching through Minneapolis. That is, that is inspiring with all the things going on today. That still some labor solidarity out there and awareness. Um, all right, a couple of things. Uh, viewers are encouraged to write questions for Dave uh, in the, the uh, chat box and uh, Dave will uh, answer them in turn. So uh, anybody who's got uh, a question, please post it. Uh, I just want to mention that there'll be a part two uh, in this series. Uh, and that will be on July the 30th at 7 p.m. Central Time and 8 o'clock Eastern Standard Time on the origin of the police. And uh, that should be fascinating. This has come up uh, quite a lot in recent times concerning the, uh, the origins of the police as slave hunters. And uh, we'll go into the history of that and how uh, their mission is essentially unchanged. And we'll explore that on July the 30th. I want to um, point out that this webinar is sponsored by Socialist Action and its newspaper, Socialist Action, which comes out every month. This is uh, quite an old copy already, because we, we haven't been printing uh, hard copies since the onset of the coronavirus. But uh, it's, it's a very attractive paper, but with really incredibly insightful and meaningful articles on the uh, topics of the day. This one is about the fight against climate change. And on the back of this one, which by the way is October 2019, is uh, U.S. attacks on Venezuela. And of course, those attacks are continuing under Trump. So uh, I would like to move into the Q&A. We have a, uh, all right, we have a question 
no name attached. Oh, from East Parra. Okay. Here's what he says, or she. I seem to remember that Jake Cooper was a member of the TC branch of SA for a year or two around 1990. I guess they want you to talk about that, Dave. Well, Jake was a member of Socialist Action uh, till his death. And, uh, but, uh, in 1990, before that, he'd been a member of the Socialist Workers Party. And uh, he had also gone to Mexico to serve as one of the guards in Leon Trotsky's household in Coyacan, Mexico. He was present there when they, uh, Trotsky was murdered by a Stalinist uh, assassin in uh, August of 1940. And uh, Jake, uh, as I mentioned uh, earlier, was uh, a key person in organizing uh, material support for the uh, for the uh, Hormel strikers in uh, Austin, Minnesota in 1985-86. At that time, he happened to own a grocery store in Chaska, Minnesota, and he uh, managed to shake down a lot of the uh, wholesalers who served his business into contributing uh, quantities of food uh, for the strikers, uh, as well as uh, we uh, organized uh, contributions from, uh, from the labor unions and brought it down to Austin, uh, I think five or six times in Jake's uh, Jake's uh, business's uh, truck, we had a big uh, tractor trailer truck. Uh, and uh, he, uh, he often spoke at the rallies uh, in Austin. He was a, he was a real hero to the, to the Austin strikers, okay. both because they knew what his background was and because he, he really stepped out to uh, bring them uh, the, the maximum uh, material support. Uh, so he was a lifetime revolutionary from the age of 16 or so, I think. Yes, uh, thank you, Dave. And I know there's at least one or two pamphlets by and about Jake Cooper and uh, I think they would probably still be available uh, by going to our website, www.socialistaction.org, socialistaction.org, where we have a selection of pamphlets for sale and other educational material and a lot of resources there. So check that out whoever is on the line is interested. Um, I'm not seeing any more questions. Uh, I, I would like to interject a question of my own. Uh, it must have occurred to a lot of other people as you're talking about the heroic uh, stand of the Teamsters in 1934, cannot help but contrast that uh, fighting spirit to the response of the labor unions today to Donald Trump and really the entire ruling classes attack on the working class it, during the time of the corona pandemic and the lack of response uh, by the unions to those attacks and I would cite well, I would highlight one attack is on the meat cutters. And I used to be uh, a member of the meat cutters union. It does not come as a terrible surprise. But when Trump uh, announced that meat cutters must go back to work, 
or else they would not get unemployment insurance. That was an astonishing uh, full assault on the rights and lives of working people. So Dave, uh, I would like you to compare and contrast the role of the unions in 34 and the role of the unions today, the role of the union leadership, I should say, because the rank and file is not in charge. And that's gonna to have to happen if we change things. Okay, Dave, could you answer that? Well, I can make a few remarks about that. Uh, American labor movement in the uh, early 1930s was uh, uh, not very vigorous at all. And uh, in fact, it was, it was so uh, retrograde that they had to create a new union, the Congress of Industrial Organizations, the CIO, to uh, be able to go forward and organize these uh, vast production industries that uh, like steel and auto and rubber and so on that uh, had not been organized in the course of the uh, American labor movement struggles, or if they had, it had only been for a very brief time before they were smashed. Uh, so the, um, uh, <clears throat> it was the workers who were responding to the uh, deprivation of the unemployment in the 30s and the lack of any kind of organization of labor on, on the job to defend them or fight for their rights. That uh, that's what gave the uh, transmitted the energy to the the great struggles uh, uh, in the you know, 30s, and uh, the um, eventually uh, the labor movement, uh, the unions that uh, reached a maximum of about 35% uh, of the workforce in the, in the early 50s. And from then on, it's been a steady decline down to maybe 6% now of the private industry that's organized in unions, a relatively higher number that are in, uh, public employees who are organized in unions. Uh, but they're, they're under attack as well. But uh, uh, the the six percent is, is even less than what the American Federation of Labor enrolled at the beginning of the uh, beginning of the, the great uh, labor uprisings of the '30s. Uh, so uh, they've got uh, beautiful, shining headquarters in Washington for the bureaucracy. And they've, uh, I think not been heard from at all in, uh, since this uh, horrendous uh, combination of uh, pandemic and uh, massive unemployment has, has come forward. I guess they're just hiding under their desks in uh, Washington, DC, uh, waiting for it to, I can't, you can look at it, you can look at their websites if you're interested and in, you won't see anything responding to this enormous crisis that the working class and others in the United States are facing and around the world are facing. And uh, they've just uh, gotten weaker and weaker and steadily declined ever since 1953. Uh, so, They've got more money than the old AFL did because they've got dues check off, and they and they're still holding on to some of their some of the acquisitions of in the big industries, but uh, so they can afford to pay themselves handsomely and live in the old fours in the marble palaces in Washington D.C. and elsewhere. But the labor movement is going to have to be entirely reformed and uh, under new leadership with a, with a fighting program uh, uh, in order to uh, fulfill its function. And 
in the meantime, the, uh, the, the, the workers are, I think, uh, anxious to see the resurgence of the unions, but it's, uh, it's beyond their capacity at this point uh, to overcome the dead, deadhead bureaucracy that runs it. So we, we have to look ahead to that. We've seen this incredible upsurge of uh, protests around Black lives around the entire world within the last uh, two months. And it's just an indication of the potential that there is for massive struggle. Uh, and uh, I think that uh, it's clear that the, uh, the ruling class in the United States has no solutions for, for COVID or for unemployment or for any of the other extremely grave threats to the human race, including uh, climate change. So what happened, one of the inspiring things that happened in the 30s as the workers began to take charge of their unions was uh, that they uh, energetically evicted the old guard uh, either through an upper story window or down the stairs and uh, transformed it into a real fighting labor movement, which uh, has uh, over the uh, intervening time has, uh, of course, been, uh, that energy has been lost, and, but it's, uh, it's there. It's, I think it's accumulating and it's gonna come, up, come forth again. That's all I have to say. All right, thank you, Dave. Uh, myself here in New York, I uh, witnessed the uh, Black Lives Matter so-called effort on Monday, the so-called July 20 strike. And uh, it was completely bungled by the union leadership, which is in fact part of the Democratic Party. And I saw a tiny turnout at one major demonstration organized by some of the unions. And it was a shame because there should have been hundreds of thousands of workers in the streets protesting racist police violence and the injustices against workers in this time of COVID. And that opportunity was completely blown. And I just wanna say the rank and file needs to take control of their unions and kick out the old guard in every one of these unions and uh, start mobilizing and fighting as I believe they would wish to do. Uh, the, the punishment uh, that workers are enduring now is incredible. Millions are out of work and the oppressed communities are, are doubly uh, um, oppressed by the coronavirus, which is uh, more prevalent in the oppressed communities than elsewhere. And people are running out of money, they can't pay their rent. And uh, there's systemic racism, which will not be, uh, not be uh, overthrown through the Democratic or Republican party. There needs to be a revolution in this country. Okay, going to a question I see posted. Uh, from Bronwyn E.D. or L.D.? I.D. L.D.? I.D. I.D. Okay, I apologize for that. Dave, you mentioned the American Federation of Labor. On your opinion, did the AFL contribute to violence against the striking workers and ultimately the deaths of Beeler and Ness? If so, how specifically? The question is, did the AFL contribute to the- Well, that, that's the question, Dave. Uh, no, the, uh, the uh, American Federation of Labor was 
uh, supportive of the strikes. And uh, they, of course, were not quite as uh, energetic and inspired as the leaders of Local 574. But uh, the, the rank and file of those unions were, and uh, they participated in the uh, in all of the struggles that, that were conducted then. Uh, the uh, employers tried to organize their own uh, counter force. They, um, they got the county sheriff to uh, end out uh, deputy sheriff badges like they were Halloween candy and uh, employers uh, basically uh, put pressure on their, their white collar workers to uh, come down and fight uh, on the side of the cops during the, during the strike battles. But uh, uh, the enthusiasm definitely wasn't there. And uh, I think uh, the, uh, in the end, the, the special deputies, they were called, were, were not even factor in the outcome of the strike. Uh, a few of the uh, employers came down uh, to uh, with the uh, illusion that they could uh, knock a few workers heads around in these street battles. Uh, one of them uh, one of them came down wearing uh, polo clothes because none of these people you know could Go into their closet and pull out a, a working a working person's uh, set of bib overalls or anything like that. So they had the, the only kind of uh, clothing they had for this this kind of uh, activity was, like I said, for bourgeois sports like uh, playing polo. And two of them were killed uh, in the battles on the streets in May. Uh, and uh, the uh, one of them, one of them was the uh, president of a corporation called the American Ball Company, which made uh, made uh, steel balls for the iron mining industry that used to polarize the iron ore with. And he uh, he apparently got. Uh, knocked in the head at some point by a, by a club and, uh, and died of his uh, injuries. And, uh, the other guy was uh, similarly, somehow got in the middle of a fight he shouldn't have been in. He was killed too. So ultimately there were at least four lives lost uh, during, uh, during these strike, street battles and the strikes. Uh, the, uh, the police department continues to try to memorialize the, these two bosses who got killed uh, and completely fabricate, you surprise, fabricate stories about how they were killed and what heroes they were in defending the uh, city of Minneapolis from rioters. So you can kind of you can hear the echoes of that today. Uh, they didn't send any federal agents in to uh, Minneapolis at that time, or they, but they did. They mobilized the National Guard in many cities, like I, I mentioned, the, the big three strikes and others in 1934, where the, the National Guard was called out. Those are basically state militias that are uh, uh, under the direction of the, the governor of the state. But uh, Roosevelt was definitely not uh, interested in taking on this huge labor uprising with uh, with force. At that time, he was trying to uh, trying to sweet talk him into uh, getting him reelected. And, uh, so they, as I think most of you know, they uh, they passed the. Uh, National Labor Relations Act, and uh, Congress did in 1935, which, uh, like all labor law, 
really just ratified what the present relationship of forces was between the, the workers and the capitalists. Uh, and uh, it, it, did, uh, it did give the unions the legal right to organize and uh, to be, uh, 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 you yeah, uh, representation elections conducted and the, uh, uh, but that was kind of, an, that was an afterthought really. I mean, by that time, the workers were already on the march. And uh, uh, by the end of 1936, they were sitting in at the uh, Chevrolet plant in Flint, Michigan it was just really taking another step forward and seizing the property of the, of the capitalists. Uh, none of that was provided for in the National Labor Relations Act, but uh, um, that uh, was really the that was really the peak of the the labor upsurge in the '30s. So it, it continued on, and then finally, because of because of the uh, interest of President Roosevelt in finding a way to get into the war, uh, he uh, got the uh, the, the so-called defense industries going. And the, the only thing that really affected unemployment was by 1940 that the United States was already arming itself and. And uh, indirectly, not so indirectly, arming uh, Great Britain. And uh, the, uh, so then uh, everything changed during World War II when there was a full mobilization of, of human beings and, uh, uh, and fe federal money to uh, build up this gigantic war machine that uh, not long afterwards got tossed into the, into the uh, World War II. And uh, at the end of World War II, there was still an unprecedented uh, strike by workers who were returning uh, from, the, uh, from the armed forces. The, the greatest strike wave in American history in 1945-46. They were on the march at that time, but uh, many things, uh, many other things intervened, as we know. Uh, essentially, the essentially the unions got uh, the maximum membership that they acquired uh, by the end of World War II, and then there was a a brief uh, blip uh, during the Korean War, which pushed up the uh, membership in the unions because of the increase in war production, it was not was not a result of the the, uh, the unions uh, going out and fighting uh, in their uh, in their occupations. But uh, as I said, from 1953 on. It's just a complete downward slide till today, and all of the uh, all of the wise and mature labor leaders who who, they, who better than the, uh, than the radicals uh, been totally impotent, totally incapable of uh, affecting anything that has to do with uh, the, the welfare of the working class. Just the opposite. So Bronwyn, I don't know, the uh, AFL uh, certainly was uh, dragging their feet to some extent in, uh, during the 34 strikes. But the, uh, one thing that w would might be well to keep in mind is that the union bureaucracy at that time was really thin compared to what it is today. And uh, the union, the typical union bureaucracy usually was a, an office in some uh, second-rate building in uh, 
fringes of downtown that had a few a few folding chairs and roll top desks in it and a few uh, few of the fat cat uh, uh, union bureaucrats who were basically just uh, twirling their thumbs and waiting for something to happen. So uh, that the whole circumstance of the labor movement at that time was, was different in, in many ways. But they weren't open strike breakers. Okay, thank you, Dave. Thank you. Um, I have a question for you. Uh, well, uh, I, I would just like to mention, you talked about the uh, people that were deputized during the strike in Minneapolis. And we actually had an encounter with deputized uh, cops in Washington Heights in uh, Upper Manhattan, where the police department went in and deputized whoever they wanted to, to go after so-called looters and rioters. And uh, we saw a bit of that, of course, there's the atrocity in Portland, Oregon, where Trump sent fe in federal troops to uh, suppress the rebellion there. Um, interestingly, uh, Andrew Cuomo, the New York governor, has threatened to send in troops to New York City, just like Trump, uh, to suppress the protesters. So we see the two parties as uh, two sides of the ruling class. And my question is, Dave, did any of the cops that shot the strikers ever do jail time? What was the story there? Nobody did jail time or uh, received any kind of other adverse attention from the, uh, from the courts or the government. None at all. Okay, okay. Uh, I'm told we got to wrap it up. We went beyond our time. Okay. Um, but it, it's been quite fascinating to revisit uh, the labor history uh, in, of 1934. It is just fabulous, fa fabulous uh, legacy for the workers' movement to know what it is to uh, get out in the street and fight the bosses, the cops, the courts, the Democratic and Republican politicians. In, uh, in Minneapolis, it was the Farmer Labor Party, which was more or less the same thing as we saw. Okay, uh, I'm going to wrap it up and remind people that there will be uh, another session on uh, this topic on July 30th at uh, 7 Central Time, 8 o'clock uh, Eastern Time. And uh, we hope everyone here joins us and uh, help us spread the word. Okay? We're Socialist Action and we're going to sign off, I believe. Lisa? Nicholas?